If I can be honest, I'm not really that much of a meme guy. What I guess you'd call general internet culture just doesn't really have that much appeal for me nowadays. That said, as a YouTuber centered around Super Smash Brothers with a social media presence, Smash memes are just kind of an unavoidable part of my life at this point. So as long as we're here, all right, let's break some of these things down. Let's establish a couple of things real quick before we begin. I'm going to limit the content of this video to memes which are relevant to Ultimate because as absolutely fantastic as... and... are, I've only got so much time to work with. I'm also by no means trying to make a comprehensive list of every Ultimate meme in existence, just some of the more prominent ones I've seen, so if I get enough good suggestions in the comments, who knows, maybe there can be a follow-up video at some point. Alright, meme time. In line with the most recent DLC release, let's tackle Fire Emblem's representation in Smash. Martha's had two direct clone characters over the course of the series, as opposed to semi-clones, tied for the most alongside Mario, which has understandably raised some eyebrows given the difference in pop culture relevance between these two. However, within the scope of Super Smash Bros., Martha is arguably more important. While Mario was a brawler alongside other brawlers, Martha was the first pure swordsman ever seen in the series, and set the design template for the archetype that others are still compared against. This naturally includes other Fire Emblem representatives to date, all of which have utilized a sword, although with clones removed, I wouldn't necessarily say they share dramatically more DNA with Marth than some other sword fighters do. Then again, people have had their issues with those characters as well, and out of every DLC fighter introduced in Super Smash Bros., a practice that started on the Wii U, 6 out of 13 have used a sword or a knife. If we include characters with very sword-like characteristics, that number rises to 8. Staying on the topic of rising, it's no secret that the Fire Emblem series representation within Smash has exploded over the previous two entries. Melee introduced one rep and a clone. Brawl kept this number the same, then in Smash 4 it became 6, then in Ultimate, 8. Correlate this with Fire Emblem sales over the years, and the results do look somewhat sensible, but how sensible exactly are they? There are 36 total franchises represented among the playable roster of Ultimate. Out of all of those, Fire Emblem has 8 representatives, tied for second most in Smash alongside Pokemon and losing only to Super Mario. Now, if we instead compare the sales figures of some of these series, even taking into account that these are rough estimates and Fire Emblem's sales are concentrated within the previous decade, that doesn't seem to line up too well, and this is coming from a fan of both the original Fire Emblem series and the characters in Smash. That said, the game's creator seems to understand this, and while he doesn't directly get to decide on the list of DLC characters, it seems highly unlikely we'll receive another representative anytime soon. Subjectively, I love the Fire Emblem fighters in Smash. Objectively, it seems vastly disproportional compared to other possibilities. Good old Ganondorf disrespect, the meme that, much like the man himself, just will not die. I've previously made a video about some of the big moves of Super Smash Bros., which naturally feature Ganondorf's Warlock Punch and Volcano Kick, but there are two other attacks that universally show up under the disrespect category. Flame Choke and Down Air. So let's take a look at them. With Ultimate running at 60 frames per second, Flame Choke's hitbox activates on frame 16, with the audio cue starting on frame 1. We can react to sound faster than visuals, which for an average person takes about 10 frames, and on top of that, Ultimate also has 6 additional frames of input lag, or the time between when you press a button on your controller and when that action is actually represented in-game. So what this means, at close range, is that Flame Choke is actually not possible to react to. This attack deals a solid 12% base damage on the ground and 15% in the air, but the real heft comes from his follow-up after the hit. It's essentially always possible to punish your opponent's option after Flame Choke, despite varying tech roles among the roster, with the very specific exceptions of Tex Away by Wii Fit Trainer, or Rosalina if Luma is there to tank the hit. And that's to say nothing about its usefulness in other tech scenarios. Offstage kamikaze situations are true disrespect, as of the 39 characters in Ultimate with a burst movement side B, Ganondorf is one of only Five with no way to act out of it until he touches the ground or ledge. On stage, though, that's not disrespect. That's just smart. Which brings us to down air, and oh god is it a down air. Smash knockback is determined by a complex formula that takes into account an attack's damage, base knockback, or the distance a move launches you at 0%, and knockback growth, or how this distance scales as your percent climbs. Comparing Ganondorf's famous stomp to a few other beefy spikes, we see some impressive numbers, which led to it being the overall strongest spike in Smash up until Violet's axe swing finally dethroned it. Offstage, this thing is a guaranteed kill past very early percent, with even the sour spot on 
on his torso being quite powerful, and it's no slouch on stage either. It's at best 9 frames disadvantageous on shield, so not quite safe, but it can be crossed up and is an electrical attack, which can interfere with your opponent's timing by locking them in their shield for longer. Although, despite a misconception I've seen, note that electricity doesn't actually make your attacks any safer. You're locked into the attack animation for just as many extra frames as they're locked into their shield. Because of the Stomp's extreme power, it doesn't have as wide a combo window as most Danner Spikes, although it is effective starting at 0% and continues up until kill confirm windows, and this power means it will also start straight up killing much earlier than most of its competitors. Throw in a frame 16 startup to match Flame Choke and the ability to two-frame recovering opponents, and despite what the funny montages will tell you, it likewise comes across as more of a good idea than disrespect. Was Ridley too big? Ridley is obviously considerably resized for most of his home series appearances. This isn't anything new for the Smash series, however, there is some precedent for him to be at this scale, namely the very first Metroid game. In their NES debut, Samus stands at 79% of Ridley's height in a crouched stance. Here, in what appears to be about the same stance for each character, it's 84%, which given the limited resolution of the original game and shifting models of Ultimate, Okay, the scales seem to match pretty well. However, we have another game to worry about. Metroid Zero Mission, which is a remake of the original outing made by the same studio where Ridley stands at this height in relation to Samus, which also occurred with other bosses. Does this imply that the Zero Mission version is the true representation of the developer's vision for this iteration of the character, meaning that a Ridley more similar to Samus' height doesn't canonically exist? Look, at this point we're stepping into some very messy ideas about canonicity, death of the author, the relationship between technology and art, and this is a tangled maze of rabbit holes that far smarter people have spent far longer on, so let's just sidestep it for now and say that Ridley's size has always at the very least fluctuated across the Metroid series, and as explored by Relaxalax, this is an original interpretation of the character which is not directly based on any single Metroid game. Whether or not Ridley has ever truly been this size in his home series, this version is its own thing, which I Again, there is precedence for. However, while other characters have gotten related treatments, that doesn't mean that they've gotten the same treatment. If we make the obvious comparison to Olimar, who was greatly scaled up in order to appear in Smash, it was done in a way that's clearly a compromise between his canonical appearances and the requirements to work in the environment of Super Smash Bros. While he's obviously colossal compared to his appearances in Pikmin, this clearly needed to be done, and he's still one of the smallest and lightest characters in the game. Another character whose canon characteristics were heavily altered is Mewtwo who is a lightweight in Smash, but actually fairly heavy in the Pokemon series. Here's the thing about Mewtwo, though. His weight in Pokemon is kind of irrelevant. When you think of the character Mewtwo, unless you're being quizzed on Pokedex trivia or talking about Smash, what pops into your head probably isn't the weight of a large man. It's much more likely to be the cat-like mutant with devastating psychic powers, and if we look at how he appears in Smash, we get a cat-like mutant with devastating psychic powers. Sure, he's very light, but in a game where this and this needs to be a reasonably fair fight, balancing factors need to come in somewhere, and turning a character who emphasizes their powerful mind into a glass cannon is sensible from a game design perspective. After all, it brings this horrendously powerful being in to join the fray at the cost of some of his physique, which doesn't really take away from what makes Mewtwo, Mewtwo. I don't know if you can say the same about Ridley. For essentially all of his appearances, or again arguably all depending on how you interpret Zero Mission, Ridley's intimidating stature is one of his defining attributes, a mighty dragon with Samus the Knight in shining armor sent to slay him. He drags her across the wall, his stomps send shockwaves through the ground, he swoops ominously through the sky, relishing in the all-encompassing shadow he casts on his next victim. Sakurai and his team were acutely aware of this when developing the character for Super Smash Bros, but in terms of actual Smash gameplay? Ridley is lighter than Samus, which if you look at this flying, spindly lizard out of context can… kind of be justified, but it requires a major reinvention of the character, and it's not the only instance. Metroid typically portrays Ridley as a lumbering monster, moving quickly only in short bursts. This translates into Smash when he walks, but his run is actually very fast. If we look at the animation, he is using his wings more than his legs, so that makes some sense except that his air physics and recovery are quite limited. His wings come across as more powerful when he's on the ground, which is a bit strange, and while you could argue that poor aerial performance is a common characteristic of heavyweights, to repeat, 
He's not terribly heavy. Olimar's changes were made in order to successfully transfer him to the environment of Smash, and Mewtwo sacrificed minor elements of his canon appearances for the sake of balance, but Ridley's transformation is far more dramatic than either of these and leaves us with a strange variety of traits on display, which I suspect there's a reason for. Sakurai had previously expressed concern with how accurately Ridley could be depicted in Super Smash Bros., and rather than risk misrepresenting an existing version of the character, it almost seems like he decided to create a new one instead one that wasn't bound by expected conventions. We had fan-created versions of the character before his official introduction, which tended to more directly try and translate him into the Smash environment, and while many of these are pretty well done, he does tend to stand out a bit compared to official fighters. In Ultimate, they did carry over plenty of references to Ridley's canonical appearances. His cunning, his ferocity, several attacks, but overall he comes off as a considerably more original incarnation, eschewing not only his traditional size, but also a lot of the aerial emphasis and signature attacks he's known for in his home series. Ridley in Smash is not an attempt to represent Ridley in Metroid as closely as reasonable. Dare I say it, he could have been a bit bigger, and even if this was tested and found to be too far against conventional Smash design, he certainly could have been a true heavyweight to imply this stature. But he's not, which makes me believe Sakurai considered Ridley as we know him unviable to design for Super Smash Bros., even with typical design restrictions, with a significant portion of that being the fact that he was, yes, too big. Was the approach that the developers took here a clever workaround or a missed opportunity? I'd like to hear what you have to say on this, because personally, I'm torn. Pikachu busted. Pikachu busted. Pikachu busted. 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 Pikachu? So, is Pikachu busted? As I've advocated on the channel before, I consider the single most important factor in a character's tier list placement to be weighted matchups, or a character's expected performance against every other character in tandem with how likely you are to encounter each of these characters in a tournament environment. I assembled a list of all characters which are cited as candidates for the best in the game, which, based on looking at top player opinions as well as their tier lists, community tier lists, and my personal judgment, I interpret to be Joker, Zero Suit Samus, Peach, Pokemon Trainer, Palutena, and of course Pikachu. You can have your opinions on which of these characters deserve to be here, I certainly do, but the important thing is that there aren't any glaring omissions. This now lets me begin the tedious process of gathering data from recent matchup charts made by reputable players. A tedious, tedious process. Words can't fully express how much I hated this. These are then multiplied by character representation statistics sourced from SSBWorld.com, smoothed out to account for absent characters, and an average of these results are then used to calculate a weighted matchup spread for each character. Note that in my original video on this topic I calculated score using a sum rather than average of results, but A, I can't do this here because I need to account for missing characters, and B, it doesn't matter because these scores are only meaningful in relation to each other. I'm not a statistician, but I've taken enough stats classes to know full well that this would get torn to shreds if I tried to hand it into a university. The overall sample size for these matchup charts isn't that big to begin with, and I had to shrink it down even further by discarding any that weren't possible to transform into a unified format. Character use stats are also for the lifetime of Ultimate, meaning they are skewed to a certain degree against characters who were recently introduced to the game or significantly patched. And of course, that's not even getting into the usual questions about how skilled and objective these players actually are at evaluating their characters. So no. No, not perfect by any means, but working with what we do have, we get this. Add on to this the fact that Joker, the runner-up, was recently nerfed, and yeah, Pikachu might be busted. Hey, you remember Plant Gang? Between Piranha Plant's reveal and Ultimate's launch, the plant supporters were out in full force, but now that the character's been out for over a year, he's the 63rd most used fighter according to SSBWorld.com. Look, is that actually terribly surprising? I wouldn't say so. The Plant Gang movement was clearly more of a joke than anything else. When Piranha Plant was revealed to the world, the reaction was generally confusion and hilarity. I don't think it's a stretch to say that this is the most unorthodox character we've seen in Smash, and while that naturally prompted a lot of people to pledge their allegiance to the plant, as the internet tends to do, I never got the impression that a lot of these people were seriously intent on maining the character. Upon release, Piranha Plant's poor mobility and frame data, combined with an 
excellent projectile ended up creating a strong incentive to play defensively and repetitively, a playstyle that isn't generally very popular among Smash players. It also wasn't typically considered to be very strong, even after the Japanese player Brood began seeing some success with it, meaning that even the core group that was genuinely interested in playing it largely fell off, although of course like even the most obscure fighters it still maintains some fans. And honestly, that's fair. Piranha Plant was a wacky addition for sure, but the eventual disinterest wasn't a huge source of suffering for the Smash world as a whole. The character certainly wasn't a hotly anticipated, long requested addition to the roster that millions of people genuinely loved long before its Smash inclusion. Oh no. Alright, if Plant Gang can be seen as a fun bit of internet sarcasm, then the groundswell behind Banjo-Kazooie can be seen as more of a… warning. Between the iconic duo's announcement and release, my timeline was flooded with happy fans of the series eagerly anticipating the opportunity to play them, emphatically stating they finally had the true main they'd been waiting for all along. In the months following their release, it turned into more of a collective disappointment and resentment towards their ultra-defensive, repetitive playstyle. Hmm. Is it really that surprising that the character turned out this way, though? Since defensive play is greatly assisted by access to projectiles, and the vast majority of projectiles in Super Smash Bros. are special moves, let's take a look at these. I went through every special move in each character's debut Smash appearance, and determined whether that move was a direct action a character took in their home series. In a title either released before that Smash appearance, or developed alongside it, as Sakurai does regularly get early access to these to pull material from. Direct clones were excluded, as there are many factors beyond design decisions that go into their creation. Based on my interpretation, we see that Ultimate has a strong increase in directly canonical special moves compared to previous entries in the series. If we limit this strictly to Ultimate DLC, which any new Smash characters will be for the considerable future, this rises to an impressive 100% of special inputs with a connection to a character's canonical abilities. On top of this, want to know how likely it is for a character in Ultimate to have a projectile in a special move slot? Look, all I'm saying is, be careful what you wish for. It's fantastic to be able to speculate and dream about your favorite video game character finally earning their place among this incredible roster. But you also don't get to be surprised if a strong projectile in their home series becomes a strong projectile in Smash. Statistically, Ultimate's design philosophy has absolutely leaned this way. Let's say, Master Chief Advocates. I know you've wanted this for a long time, and if it ever happens, I'll be genuinely happy for you, the same as I was for Banjo-Kazooie and Plant fans. Hey, my characters use swords and bows, zoning is nothing new to me. That said, I'd also better not be seeing any tweets about how bored you are of playing him a week later. At this point, we should all know exactly what we're signing up for. Thanks for watching everyone, and hey, if you liked it, why not leave a like? As I said, this is far from a comprehensive list, so if you have any good suggestions for another video in this format, please feel free to leave them in the comments. But before that, be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell, follow me on Twitter at MrMockRock to see what I'm up to, and check me out on Patreon for exclusive content, early video access, Discord discussions, and other cool rewards. Later, people! Alright, the concept of a well-designed Smash character will change quite a bit depending on who you ask, so here are a couple points of criteria that I personally looked at when I was making this list. Will the player feel restricted in an unexpected way? Today we take a deeper look at only the biggest of big moves Smash Ultimate has to offer, why they don't see much play on the tournament stage, and what you can do if you are desperate to pull them off.